<laughs> oh, we're live. We're live. We're on the show. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Stripes with Slyke on the Jungle Podcast Network here from the Liger Partners Studio in beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. I'm here with the one, the only Joe Chandler. <laughs> People are oh, out of the seats right now. What's up, man? Uh, dude, you're the... Uh, okay, Joe and I go way back, right? Like way, like 2001? Yeah, we're at 20 years, I think, now. From the yes. two world Halloween shows to here. Yes, our our if our relationship were a person, it would be sneaking into bars. Yes, just underage. <laughs> yeah, we did the SeaWorld Halloween show together. Um, the first year we were in different areas. Second year we had the same area and I was the sheriff and you were the deputy and you got yelled at by uh, oh. a vice president or something. Oh, no. I mean, am I allowed to swear on this? Podcast? Yeah, sure. I, I told the guest to fuck off and, it, and I looked over and the VP of the park was standing right next to me. And was very cool about it. Like, took me for a walk and was like, it's clear you've had a long day and didn't fire me and just told me to, like, go chill out for an hour. It was amazing. That's rad. Yeah, that's, like, good management. He was like, I, I could tell you're a good guy and you just, you messed up. So you're all right. It was <laughs> <laughs> he was like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, we've come, a long, we've come a long way since then. I'm the director of creative strategy here at Lager Partners, and you are the executive producer of American Dad. I am. I am a an executive producer. I'm one of several. No, I, I, I'm one of several executive producers of like fifty. No, there's uh, seven of us. I think it's right, a so you, it's a title thing where you sort of work your way up, and you you know you ah. So yeah, you're yeah. in the top ten of the show, though, right? In seniority, yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm not going to start singing my own praises on that stuff. But yeah, in seniority, I've been there for nine years. It's been a really long run on a show, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, just, just about half the episodes of the show I've been there for. Well, that's been on for 18 years? It's. We are on, at the end of this season that we're doing right now, we will have made 344 episodes of the show. That's crazy. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely insane. Ooh, April Holtzkall says, hello. Oh, do we get live comments on this thing? Is that what's yeah. happening? Oh, I yeah, did not know we're, that. We're live on. Okay. Yeah, people are watching on Facebook. All right. And, um, well, something that I don't, yes, I think I told you, but to reiterate, Liger Partners is based on the movie Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah. Um, and we have, it's like ingrained in our culture. Like everything I do, we do is, is Napoleonific dynamic. <laughs> okay. Liger ish. I'm curious um, what that means exactly, but uh, well, yeah. yeah. We well, like, uh, I'm redesigning our business cards and on the back, it's going to look like the Preston high school, uh, yeah. ID card. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and you're, you were a writer for the Napoleon Dynamite cartoon. Yeah, they, that was actually my, it was my second writing job, but we did the Napoleon Dynamite animated show. There was, we did six episodes. It was an absolute blast. Uh, it, it, Jared it has basically Jared like the there. sequel to the movie, right? I, you know, it was sort of like, uh, it, it was just like, let's spend some more time in this world. And I, I will say when I got there, I was like, it was so fun to just like revisit those characters. And the movie is a little bit tone pony too. There's like, it wasn't like there was an end of the movie where you're like, oh, something else is going to happen. Now you're just like, okay, these kids are still in high school, and it was so fun to just be like, what else would happen to them in this world? It was, I mean, I loved working on it. It was, they were the best, and the, it's like everything. You know, Jared has to direct the movie, and his wife Jerusha has, uh, who was there, who she didn't direct it, but they think they wrote it together. If I remember that right, but like. Every story Jared tells, he tells in that Napoleon Dynamite voice, and you realize like that voice came from him. Like it was fully his. Like it, you know, he tells a story about his brother, and it's like, or he, my favorite is he was telling a story about his son, and his son was like, "Hey, Dad, I've got 
I've got an hour of video game time. Let's knock it out right now. And it's just like, oh, this is just like, this comes from Jared's mind, this voice. It was very funny. But yeah, it was. It was so that's where the Napoleon character came from. I mean, I think more or less, yeah, it was like the, the sort of the, the rhythm of the talking came from Jared's mind, I think. That's just the way. It's, it's how Jared hears people, I think. They all talk like Napoleon in his head. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like how when somebody's quoting someone, they might just always, it's like their go-to voice for, for yes. relaying a conversation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a stand-up comedian doing like a white guy voice, if, if that makes sense. You know, it's like... Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was really funny, though. And it was a blast. That show, is, uh, that movie is so good and so funny and cool. And, you know, it's great. And, and in, in that, I, I believe you wrote one line that is still stands above as the highlight of your career. Which line is that? <laughs> uh, today, the tattoos on my face. <laughs> Wait, the tears on my, tears face, my face are not are just not tattoos. Just tattoos. <laughs> yeah, I do remember Which, that. Thank you. If you think about it, that is gold. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the tears on my face are not just tattoos. That's right. I did. I, I, yes. I, you know what? Like, that was one of my early successes. You know, when you're a writer in the room and you're like just trying to get stuff in the script and you think of something and it goes in. And since that time, it's been, you know, it's been 10 years since I worked on that show. I've, there's so many more jokes that have gone the air. Now I don't remember any of them because it's yeah. like, now it's what you do. Uh, <laughs> you do remember the jokes, yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to watch it and be, and, and be like, okay, Joe wrote that one. Joe wrote that one. Joe <laughs> yeah. It's funny we get hit up on Twitter. Okay, not that often, but every once in a while we get hit up on Twitter by somebody being like, Oh, there's a reference to this literally just happened where a friend of mine who now has a new show, but he was there for a long time. His new show, Modoc, it premieres today. So everybody watched Modoc on Hulu. Um, but somebody asked him about like a comic book reference, and it, and it was like, this has to have been you that wrote this, right? And he tagged me, and he was like, no, I think it was Joe Chandler. And I, I was like, it wasn't me. I don't know who it was. And it's like, there's like a, people are investigating who wrote the jokes. And it's, <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not super common, but it does happen. It's fun because like if you actually know somebody and you know their sense of humor and you hear that joke, you're like, ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that, that's a perfect I've had people segue. be right and I've had people be wrong. Just to, yeah, you can yeah. say. Yeah. It's a perfect segue into oh, what I really wanted to talk to you about because this is about the ROI of creativity. Okay. But I want to know about the writing process like how do you come up with the idea that these characters are gonna like like roger like yeah. he's like the most versatile character you can have him be or do anything you absolutely you want as long as it's self-serving yeah absolutely yeah so how do you like come up with an idea pitch it to people uh and then workshop it like what's the process well, I mean, you know, you, you come at it a lot of different ways, right? And it's, you know, when you're working on this on American Dad, you're sort of constantly, you know, the things that happen, most of the stuff, I think almost everybody, the initial kernel comes from something that happens in real life. It's, you know, um, I sprained my ankle playing basketball and I went to the doctor and the, the doctor told me like, what did the doctor say to me? He's like, um, you know why I've never had ankle surgery? It's because I stopped playing basketball when I was 30. He basically told me I was too old to play basketball, <laughs> lucky that I should stop. <laughs> and so, you know, I went back to my writing partner, Nick. Um, we write solo on the show now, but we were we wrote together for seven years. And I was like, I was just thinking about like, what if, you know, Roger has this basketball and he's a, he's got a basketball character and he sprains his ankle and then he feels like he's too old. And like, and that's, so that was the starting point. It was like, and then, you know, it turns into you take that idea to a room and somebody goes like, well, what if Stan plays in like an old man basketball game and he invites Roger? And then because, you know, Roger's selfish, you know, Roger's going to ruin that for Stan. And then so it, a lot of the, the initial stuff usually just comes from like a random thing that happens to you or a movie you see. And I think you're right to bring up Roger because he's always the first thing we talk about because it's <laughs> when you go like. Is he go, your favorite thing to write for? I mean, for sure, absolutely. And like, yeah. 
because he's it's like you like oh they have a scene at the bank and they're like you always basically you always discuss like what if roger was the bank teller like what would that what would happen to the story if roger got involved here and you end up not doing a lot because you're like he can't be everyone even though he can't be everyone which is like you know I, like no other show has a character like this who can he can just yeah. pop up anywhere you need him to um and so he a lot of stories get built around him because he drives story so well Mm -hmm. you know, but and we will find that sometimes it's harder. We'll like go away from something because it requires him to be emotionally invested in a way that he doesn't. That is, I think, a little bit not believable for him. But yeah, um, uh, to sort of slightly answer that, also where the ideas come from, question a little bit more is: we work in you know, there's 16 writers on the show, 17 writers on the show. The, that number fluctuates a little bit. But like, you go in a room with like five or six people, you bring a kernel of an idea, like. I've gone into that room and like, I have an idea for a story and it's, this happens. It's like, I have all the beats and within five minutes of talking about it, it's a totally different story because there's like five, six people collaborating and being like, they see something you didn't see. They pull it in a different direction. You resist initially because you love your idea and then you realize they're right. And you start running down that path. It's like, a you you're know, like you, hanging on to your baby and then yeah, yeah, yeah. you let your baby, Speaking of, congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> two American dads <laughs> talking about uh, American dad. True, true, two true American dads. Um, thank you. Yeah, he's he's doing great. He's awesome. That's, <laughs> um, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But so it's, I don't know, like TV writing is so collaborative. It's so, it's American dad especially, so deeply collaborative that it's like to say where an idea came from is, all, or to say that you wrote a joke, it's almost impossible to actually take credit for it. You know, like, well, you or you can go the other way and and just take credit for everything. Say, yeah, uh, I was yes. in the room. Yeah. You could. <laughs> there are shows that do that. There are shows where like the creator is like has their name on everything, and I, I think sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. But uh, we've been on for so long that it really is just like the people, the people who are there get to sort of explore their idea with the help of people like you know making it better. So. Um. So I mean the the who's the boss like is yeah. he still involved a lot or well did he just come in and read um, the the show is run by uh, Matt Weitzman who's one of the creators of the show and then uh, Brian Boyle who start was he wrote on Friends and some other things and he has been on the show from the beginning he was like a really high level writer when he got there. And he took over my second year, I think. So those two guys kind of run the ship. Um, what we do is we break into a room of five, six people, and we're like, okay, it's Joe, it's my episode, we're gonna break a story for me. I sort of say like, this is my idea. The room talks it out, we come up with, you know, we put it on a whiteboard, we sort of know what the story is. Then we bring Brian and Matt in, we pitch them the story, they give us some feedback, uh, and that's sort of how you, like launch, then you go off and you write an outline, then you write a script. But that is like, they're the gatekeepers of sort of what, what the show's gonna ultimately do. It's like they, um, you like run up the flagpole with them. And okay. You know, yeah. Uh, has, <laughs> I'm sure there's been like a lot of ideas that have just not been used, but that were, you thought were brilliant. Like this happens in advertising all the time when- yeah. We'll we'll create something that's an amazing idea, and then the the client doesn't want to go for it, or yeah, yeah. too big of a risk, or it costs too much. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are your what's one idea that you had that you really wish you could have done? Ooh, um, after I'm I'm literally writing my 18th American Dad script right now, so like I have gotten to do a lot. But I will say that I wrote one this year. Um, that was in a room about four years ago, we were talking about an idea that was like a Romeo and Juliet story with Steve and his best friend, Snot, where they get torn apart by their parents. And um, it was, we were able to like, we were able to bring that story back. Cause like this year I was like, oh, I need an idea. And you like, you remember this idea from four years ago and there's notes on it and that are on our server. So like, we're, you know, I was able to write that one this year because it's like, there's time to go back, there's space to go back, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can't think of one that I haven't gotten to do that I'm also that I also don't think I might be able to do someday. Like I've got a I have a Gmail tab of a bunch of American Dad ideas that are just lingering there, you know. Some of them bad, some of them so, good, I'm sure. So yeah, so you're just when you look when you're trying to come up with an idea, do you just um do you look at that list? Yeah, so I've got like here, I'll I'll I'm not looking yeah. at you now, but I'm I'm let's, on my Gmail tab. I've let's got I've got green stars next to emails, and I literally have like Roger is an arborist. <laughs> you know, it's like that's it's just stuff like that where you're like <laughs> um someone in the family, some <laughs> someone in the family falls for the Ray Ban scam. That's like uh, you know, my friend was like, dude, there's this crazy sale on Ray Bans today in real life. <laughs> And I went online and I bought Ray Bans for twenty dollars. I was like, "Wait a minute, these are fake. These are not going to be real Ray Bans." And it's like, yeah. uh, you know, so you just like go through that and then you think about them a little bit more, and um, you know, and do you just like pull it out to its inevitable end, or what would be the most ridiculous thing that would happen to this, and then pull it back a little? I think that you go. It's a little bit of both. Where I, you know, to me. And not all of the episodes of the show are like this. I do think like having some emotional storyline is really important to the show. So like, for example, that basketball one, which we did it, you know, I think that there was like, it became about Roger feeling old and needing to feel better. But then you, ultimately you make it about Stan realizes that he needs to do something good for Roger. So like that he realizes his friend is in a funk and that he needs to help him despite the, despite what it will cost Stan, he wants to help Rod. You know, despite knowing that Roger will come in and ruin his good time, he knows it's worth it to like help this member of his family. And so like, there's like that episode ends with like Roger's leg breaking and stabbing Yao Ming, the bone stabs Yao Ming through the leg. Like it's <laughs> like, it, it gets crazy, but it, there is like an emotional undercurrent that is like, that is important, you know, so it's, um, yeah, it can't, it can't just be all, you know, uh, yeah. It, if it's all chaos, it's not yeah. as much fun. It, well, it is fun. I think there are shows I love that are pure chaos and like a lot of the adult swim stuff will lean more heavy towards it just goes crazy. And I think that stuff is super fun to write, super fun to watch. But I do find that personally, I won't watch all of the episodes of a show like that. I'll be I'll watch three and be like, that show is super funny. Like, yeah. I'm good. You know, like, I know, I know they're do I know they're writing great jokes. I don't need to see more of it, but I think you, you want people invested in the story a little bit. And so, um, I, you're sort of doing both where a room is talking about really chaotic ideas and really, you know, like it's, you know, we're blowing up the moon and then you all, like, hopefully people are also saying like, but it feels like is, is blowing up the moon what he would do to like help to make, make Francine feel better is like, is that why he's motivated to do that thing? Is that the thing that motivates that action? So it's like a really long, you know, it takes about two, three weeks to break a story in the room. And that's, you know, four or five hours a day of people discussing and throwing around ideas. And um, so, you, you know, you end up with on a story, you end up with like, there's like seven paths before you pick the one that you are going to walk down, you know, choose your own adventure. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you, sometimes you throw out the funniest thing because you're like, this is, it just doesn't make sense that, or like this won't get me to where the characters need to be. You know, the characters need to be apologizing here and this is making it worse, <laughs> so, you know, that sort of thing. Got it. Yeah. And um, how long does it take to, to finish a story from concept to watching it on TV? It takes a, a, about a year. You, okay. Uh, so we have to, you know, we have to be conscious of being evergreen and like a lot of times you'll like get a cut back and realize like, oh, this is sort of, this joke was of this time, you know, like we should probably change this. But you, it takes about two, three weeks to like break the story with that's with the room. Another two weeks to write the script. Then you have a table read. Uh, and then you, after the table read, you do, you cast it, you record all the voice actors, you make a radio play of it. The animators get that, and the animators, or the artists, sorry, um, they are animators, but we, we call them artists, which they are. The storyboard artists? Yeah, storyboard artists, the directors, the character designers, they're, and they're all, they're all so brilliant. Um, 
they take about three months and they give you what they call an animatic, which is essentially storyboards set to the radio play. So it's like station to station drawings. Um, and then you get a chance to rewrite that. So about three months after the initial table read, you do a rewrite of it. And that ships to Korea. Korea does all the uh, animating in between the boards. And that takes about six, seven months. So it like, and then you have another couple months to like lock it and, you know, mix it and all that stuff and do the final colors and stuff. And that is, yeah, it like takes about a year for it to be ready to go. Okay. So in a year, I, I assume that you grow, you become a better writer. Have you ever uh, had a thing that's you wrote this thing a year ago mm -hmm. and you watch it a year later and you're like, oh, man, that was terrible. Why did I do that? <laughs> I mean, you have, like, writer's remorse. Yeah, I mean, that's constant, right? I think that's like, uh, the, the creative's way, right? I, like, I don't know. I think that um, <laughs> not all creatives are like this, but I certainly am where I there's a ton of self-doubt involved in the process. And yeah. there's a ton of, um, and I, I think I, I want that, right? Like, I want to watch an episode and be like, oh, I, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done this this way. But I also want to, I don't know, like, I, I want to feel like there's a better idea, right? Like, I don't, it's otherwise, like, you're like, I don't know. I, I think it's unhealthy if you think you have the best idea. It's like, you're not open to hearing the best idea from somebody else if you're like, no, no, I'm right. So I have episodes that I remain proud of, but all of them have flaws. And there are episodes that I've written that I don't, I wish didn't exist, you know, that they're like. Oh. Um, was, that, yeah. was that something that you wish it didn't exist because your ideas on certain topics have changed or, or because uh, culture or you just I think there's what you're good about? I think there is like, if it's not good enough, I don't mind that it doesn't that it exists because I, I also think that that's the that's the critic in you knowing that you would have done it better or what you consider to be better now. Because um, I do think it, you know just because you think it would be better a different way doesn't mean you're right because it's this is all subjective, right? This is like mm -hmm. it's the whether or not an episode of television is good is a completely subjective process, and you can tell that just by like reading Twitter threads about shows or just reading people talk about shows you love. You're like, Oh, I, lo I thought that was great. Like this, somebody didn't like that. Um, and then there's just, you know, I think the world, especially in the last few years has changed so rapidly. And, um, so there's things that you're just like not proud of, you know, like ideas that you put into the world that you're like, oh, I'm not sure I, you know, I thought, I think more often, like, I thought that was a joke and I don't think that's a joke anymore. Like, I don't think that, I think that's not funny anymore, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and you see it, you see it a lot with like, it's, you know, I, you know it's like there's 16 year old people tweeted a joke when they're, what was funny to them when they were 16 and obviously isn't funny to them when they were 30. And it's like, because it's on Twitter and permanent, there's like, it comes up and you're like, how do you rectify that? But like, Without even, I don't know, just like there's things like, I'm just not proud of that moment. I just don't think that's a good moment that I put a, out in the world. So it's a weird thing. You're like, yeah, you know. I remember like in high school, early college, I, I, I thought that, um, I thought that uh, a comedian's Adam Sandler's uh, like CD, like comedy yeah. CD, like I thought that was hilarious hi courtney thanks for, <laughs> for joining in <laughs> and but it but then like i watched i i listened to it again a few years later yeah it's horrible unlistenable it's like how what kind of person i was to think that was funny. <laughs> yeah but, totally totally like yeah. insensitive and it, it, yeah, you're just like your taste changed and the world changes. And I don't know, mm -hmm. it's a weird, like, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a weird one. And we got uh, a, we just had a, a question from, um, I believe Michael, it was, he's a big fan of American dad and he wants to know what's your favorite episode. Uh, of the one, yeah, so the, the ones I've worked on, the ones I've written, I think that my favorites are crisscross applesauce, the ballad of Billy Jesusworth, which is the basketball one, and uh, Top of the Steve, which is uh, we did like a um, Steve ends up in a spin off sitcom 
like 80s style sitcom and has to escape it. Uh, of the ones that I've been there for, I think um, the 200th episode, which is called the 200, I thought was really brilliant. And um, what is the name of the one? The Nighthawks one. There's a really good one where it's like the stand is trapped in like a, it's again, it's like trapped in a weird TV show, but it's called Nighthawks, I think. And he like, he finds an old television that broadcasts a black and white show and it like, it's a Twilight Zone thing. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Uh, but now you've had the opportunity to then be on the show as yourself. Yes, I have. getting written into the show. Now, was that your idea or was that somebody saying, hey, we should put Joe in here? Uh, that was not my idea. I, <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, I, put me in the show. Um, the uh, writer that we have, Teresa Shaw, is who is really brilliant. She left. She actually does. Uh, she's doing Nora from Queens now in Comedy Central. Um, but she she turned in an episode where uh, there was a character that was a pervert who was obsessed with Haley, and she named him Joe Chandler as a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was the origin of the character being named Joe Chandler, and uh, you know, now I beg for them to put it in because that's more money. The uh, there is another character named after a current writer. Uh, there's a character named Parker Day, who's also one of the writers. Oh, nice. And Teresa did that as well. She did. She put both of us in the show. <laughs> and Parker's in the show all the time, but rarely referred to by name. But he is the he's a fan of the arena football team. And so he's constantly running through scenes saying bazooka sharks. <laughs> and, bazooka uh, sharks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, a gift that Teresa gave us, of both making fun of us, but also giving us a semi-recurring income stream uh, but that part's the i mean the records are the most fun because you just sort of you go in and you just like goof off and it doesn't take very long and as so the the appearing as a voice actor is very easy work it's great but yeah. you've been animated as well because mm -hmm. i i've watched the show and i mean like that's joe yeah my model i have a model they call it so they uh oh. uh the initially i appeared without a beard because the pervert character this, I mean, you're a bearded guy. You understand the, the how upsetting this was. The uh, <laughs> the pervert character appeared as a child, and there was a feeling from the people who were made, from the artist that you wouldn't be able to connect the child to the adult if the if the adult didn't or if the adult had a beard. So uh, in my initial appearance, there's no beard, but every other appearance since then, I've they've added the beard. <laughs> they've bearded me. So yeah, the first one we might not even recognize that it's kind yeah, of I mean, it, you know it's, it's a name. I don't think it looks like me. It looks like a you know a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> I had long hair when they did my model too, so really big, like very flowy hair. It looks looks great, you know. Oh, it's, fun. Cool. it's fun to be an animated character. You know, it's great. That is that that's on my bucket list. I want to yeah. do. I want to be an animated character and do some voiceover. I think that that'd be a heck of a lot of fun. It is a blast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I actually, um, I actually wrote a joke. <laughs> All right, love last, it. Last night I wrote a joke, and I was hoping you can critique it for me, <laughs> or maybe we can workshop it. Into okay. Let's let's see what we can do. In my notes, this is me laying in bed. It's uh, I want to start a cycling club called the Cycling Minstrels. So when everyone and whenever anyone asks, "Is that your bike?" I can answer, "No, it's my minstrel cycle." <laughs> I mean, it is a dirty dad joke, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I don't think I have notes on that. I think maybe, maybe maybe you could get to the punchline faster, but I think bad jokes are often helped by taking a long time to get to the punchline. Mm -hmm. Maybe like you build the anticipation and then it's a letdown. Yeah, I mean I think it's good, it's a good letdown. It's sort of a like you know, there's some like joy there's some joy and disappointment, I think, that that jokes play on in a good way I, it's a good joke i think you're in good shape on that joke well do you know uh brown chicken brown cow no well the question is what are the two sexiest animals on the farm mm -hmm. it's brown chicken brown cow 
but you're supposed to say brown chicken brown cow <laughs> brown chicken brown cow <laughs> These are unusable jokes. These are terrible. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> this is terrible joke. That's not true, actually. I would say, like, there is something. Of, one of the reasons that Roger's a good character is that you can give him bad jokes, and because it is like you can get laughs out of him because it's his attitude and telling the bad jokes that is good. You know, that is good. It is better when he has good jokes, but you can the character can deliver bad jokes. Like so, knowingly. so he he has like this trunk of costumes and wigs and, mm -hmm. and all his uh, different things that make him unrecognizable as an alien. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> go along with it. Um, are do you, are you just coming up with new ones all the time, or are you bringing back old ones? Or you, you, I mean, it is like I think we try to do new ones all the time, and it's hard to not repeat yourself, but it is like, you know, you basically every episode, there's a place to throw them in as somebody. And so you do it and you like give him a new outfit and a new name. And it's, and it, you know that his like mission as a, as a character is to commit to those things. And so it's, you can, that you know that he takes that seriously above all else. And so it's like, that's, when you're breaking the story and you're like, okay, he's going to be the janitor here. You're like, okay, he's all in on, he cares about being a janitor here and he's got, you know, and he wants to be the best janitor. he can yeah, be. Yeah. Or, yeah. or he wants to be the worst janitor he can be because that's what the, the character is a bad janitor. Like, you know, we do that with him too. It's like, Oh, I'm a bad director. You're like, okay, great. He's like, he's being a bad, as being the worst director he can possibly be. He's being the worst bad man like he can possibly be. Drug use and, and yeah objectifying people yeah. we did i don't I even remember what episode this is in but we did we made him a madman at one point we, we did madman with him and he sings the he, he sings the madman theme song and he goes roger roger marketing marketing <laughs> marketing yeah, i missed that one I, have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what episode that's in that was that was a few years ago roger <laughs> it's really, it's very good. Hold on, let's see if I can find it. Uh, oh, man, Craig's like, Craig's like. Yeah, Craig, you get it. Craig <laughs> Craig it. Oh Marketing my genius goodness. me. Mm. Widow's Peak. Oh, that's in Sam Brenner's episode. That's a, that's one of my favorite episodes. Wid Widow's um, Peak? Widow's Peak. It's um, uh, our writer, Sam, I think it was his, I think it was when he was our writer's assistant, he wrote a script, but it's the, um, Roger finds out that when Stan goes out of town on missions, Francine pretends to be a widow or maybe, I don't remember how, it's something like that. Uh, but basically it's like how she copes with the fear of loss as she pretends that Stan's already dead and she gets all the benefits of being a widow, like free meat at the butcher shop. And <laughs> it's like people treat her well for being a widow. <laughs> Um, but it's, you know, based on our fear. Uh, yeah, right. I, was, I really like that episode. Sam, Sam's a really good writer. Dude, so what are, are, are you continuing to do stuff with uh, American Dad? Do you have other projects going on? Are you still doing stuff with uh, Upright Citizens Brigade? Uh, we wrapped our, so right now it's just American Dad. I mean, the plan is obviously to, do do my own show at some point so that's always trying to do that but american dad is going strong and hanging out um and then the use that we wrapped our ucb show two years ago so that's been we did a 10-year run at ucb and wow. that's done now so yeah now i'm just being a dad and trying to write jokes and you know american dad is a really fun place to work so it's like no rush to get out of there you know but always yeah working, always working to do like the the thing where you're the boss and you know, you get so all So should I, should I, when I get these uh, show ideas in the middle of the night, should I be texting them to you? Uh, in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I, you, you are, you are dealing with a baby. And I want them to go through your filter first, you know, like the midnight ideas aren't always good. You have to wake up in the morning and see if you still like it. That's the, uh, all right. you can type the text and then, I'll Put it in my notes. In the morning, yeah, yeah. In the morning, if it's not terrible, 
copy and paste it over to the chat, that's right that's to right the chandler yeah, so, yeah. hey dude let's start up a show <laughs> it's the craig's like show featuring craig's like <laughs> what, do you, what do you think is that a good idea i feel like that's what it's gonna say i i think that's i need I you to do a little bit better. I need a little bit more work than that. I think I need a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more proof of concept from you on that. <laughs> I'm walking proof of concept. That's, I, I mean, that my that's a fair point, and I, the bravado certainly gets you some points. I think it certainly gets you across the line in some in some meetings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, how can people find how can people find you? I mean, I'm not super online, but I'm at Joe Chandler on Twitter, and I'm. Uh, Joe Bart Chandler on Instagram, but that's baby pictures mostly. Um, but you know, watch American Dad. That's the best way to. That's the best way to see what I'm up to. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. I really uh, appreciate good. you you coming on. It's been way too long. Great uh, to see you. It's like I'll find yeah. my Slack shirt and then I'll I'll uh, reassure you that I still have it. Well, so. then you have to post it on Instagram and Twitter of uh, pictures of you wearing it with yeah. the famous people. <laughs> I'll do my best. I don't meet a lot of famous people. The uh, animation is not a fame fame based world. Well, so. when, when you go to Comic Con, yeah, that's true. <laughs> As I know you're in on the industry parties. Yeah, that's right. That is yeah. right. <laughs> and you need a plus one, and I'll fly out there for yeah, yeah. It'll be great. You're in. You're in. All right. Yes. Guys. Great to talk to you. <laughs> great to talk to you, man. And uh, hey, if I if I need a guest some other time, can I can I ask you to come back? Yeah, no problem. I'd love it. I'd love it. All right, cool. All right, thanks, Joe. Great talking to you. Yeah, good thanks, talking. Thanks, everybody. You've been watching uh, Stripes of Slike, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye.